Hello everyone. Today we are going to finish up our discussion on culture and we are going to talk about academic culture. The reason I want to talk about academic culture is because currently you all are young scholars. Uh, most of you are freshman level coming into, into college. And the question becomes is, you know, what is it about these four years uh, that, you know, what is it that you should be doing in these four years to sort of walk across that stage with a diploma in four years that says, you know, I am now a part of this culture, this community. Um, I'm part of a group of individuals who uh, have a college degree. And this is what sets me apart from people who don't have a college degree. All right now, let me be very clear. This does not mean that you're a better person. All right. Uh, I have a PhD. It does not mean that I am smarter or better than other people. What it means is that I read a lot of books specific to the academic canon, all right, and I wrote a lot of papers, all right? That's all that means, all right? When it comes to academic culture, all right, we take the word culture, which we've discussed, which is a shared systems of values and beliefs amongst, you know, a, a, a large group of people, right? So we think, okay, what are the certain, what are the values that are part of um, academia? What are the certain beliefs they have? You know, what is the set of knowledge? Like what's what's the foundational facts that we should all be agreeing upon in order to start the academic debates that we have going forward, right? If you don't have a shared system of values and beliefs sort of at the foundation, you have no way of talking to other people within your community or within your culture, all right? So an academic culture says, you know, what is the foundation that from which we all start? We can still have debates and arguments, which trust me, academics do, right? But we have this sort of foundational set of uh, knowledge points that we all start from, okay? So when you leave here in four years with a diploma, um, what is it that you should have accumulated over those four years? Now below I have two videos, all right? The first is the convocation speech that I gave in the fall of 2020. It's a 10 minute speech to incoming freshmen that answers that question. What should you be doing for the next four years, all right? The second video that I have down below is a video I just made in my spare time about what a liberal arts degree means. What is it that you're expert in? If you have a liberal arts degree, that's also below. So if you're going into something in the humanities, whether it's comm arts and science, communication, psychology, sociology, uh, English would probably be in like English history. Um, yeah, those degrees, right? Um, what is it that you should be doing in the next four years, all right? What is it that allows you to walk across the stage and says, I am now part of a culture, part of a community. This is my shared values, systems, norms, and knowledge set that I have that allows me to be a part of this conversation, all right? So that's what we're talking about when we talk about the academic culture. We're gonna start with this painting, which is a painting that I absolutely love. All right, it's written, uh, excuse me, it's written. It was painted by one of the four uh, Ninja Turtles, uh, Raphael. Um, that's a little joke that I like to tell my students because they know all the Ninja Turtles and they don't know the painters, Raphael, Donatello, Leonardo, and Michelangelo, all right? Ninja Turtles are named after Renaissance painters in case you didn't know. Okay, this painting is referred to as the School of Athens. Uh, it's painted by Raphael. I'll get into some of the more details on the next slide. But what it does is it depicts all of these foundational characters, um, foundational people who created what we now refer to as like the Western canon or Western civilization, all right? Um, I use the term Western canon and academic canon interchangeably. I try to use academic canon more because as we sort of continue to progress, all right, um, throughout society, uh, influential writers and academics and thinkers come into the fold of the foundational canon uh, that aren't necessarily from the West, all right? Um, and we'll talk more about that near the end when I talk about some of the criticisms of the Western canon. Um, but this painting depicts uh, very uh, important people um, that are foundational, right? These are foundational. It doesn't mean that it's like exclusive to these individuals. It just mean these were a lot of people who started doing this stuff first, all right? This was painted by Raphael. Um, these people did not live at the same time, right? This isn't an actual picture of, of these individuals, right? These are people who lived throughout, you know, various centuries. Okay, uh, so for instance, we have, you know, uh, Socrates over here in the green. He was the teacher. He was sort of the first as far as philosophy. He's the teacher of um, Plato, right, here in the red, who was then the teacher of Aristotle. So all three of these, they obviously didn't, you know, they weren't all living at the same time. They weren't all the same age at the same time, right? This is Raphael's depiction of everybody um, who's foundational. Uh, down here, we have some people doing some math. Um, over here, we have some people doing some cartography and astronomy. We'll talk about those characters momentarily, right? 
It's called the School of Athens, all right? Foundational people who started, started the conversation in their various fields. So again, it's painted by Raphael uh, over the course of almost three years. It's painted fresco, right, um, in the Vatican, right? So you say, okay, what does fresco mean, all right? Which it means it's painted into the wet plaster as the wet plaster is fresh. So this isn't a painting you just hang on the wall and take it down and move it to another museum. It's actually on the entire wall, all right? Uh, same is true with the Sistine Chapel, right? It's painted on the ceiling into the fresh plaster. Um, again, it represents the foundational Western figures uh, in search for knowledge, right? And we have these three questions when it comes to the search for knowledge, right? These are three foundational questions, okay? You can ask metaphysical questions, you can ask epistemological questions, and you can qu uh, ask moral questions, okay? These uh, th this, this painting is of individuals who are asking these types of questions. So if you're a person who's interested in metaphysical questions, you're interested in what exists, all right, so the oldest metaphysical question, for instance, would be like, does God exist, right? Like, look, what tangibly exists? You, if you're a botanist, you go out in the world and you're like, okay, what exists, right? I'm gonna go around, I'm gonna, you know, look at botany, right? I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna go around, I'm gonna look at, um, you can go around the world and look at uh, animals. It's like, I wanna, you know, catalog animals. Like, how do they act? How do they behave? I'm asking what exists, all right? Epistemological questions, which I think epistemology is a fascinating, field of study, right, um, is how do we know what exists, right? What are the foundational ways in which we ask and answer questions, and how do we know where that knowledge comes from, right? Is it from experience? Is it from experts? How is knowledge passed down? How is knowledge cared for? Um, when Once we have knowledge, how do we sort of um, ask more difficult questions about that knowledge in order to figure out whether or not that knowledge is true? Right, so questions of like the scientific method, right, to go through a process in order to refine our knowledge, okay? These are epistemological questions. How do we know what exists? And then finally, uh, we have these morality questions. Now, some people, you know, hear the word morality and they immediately go to sort of moral questions. That's not what morality means exclusively in this regard. What, mora what morality questions are is how do we act based on what we know, right? So what this means is, we know how the world exists, right? Not the world that I want, but the world as it actually is. And how can I behave in a way in order to get through the world as it actually exists? Now, I might be a very selfish, self-centered person. I just wanna go through the world and just you know, do whatever I want and be greedy and be selfish and like run over people um, to get whatever I want, right? But we know that the world doesn't work that way. We know that if I act in this sort of ultra selfish way, I'm not gonna have the life I want. So a morality question would be, you know, Josh, imagine the life you want. All right, safety, security, financial security, you know, happiness, contentment, joy, um, purpose, right? Okay, now how do I need to act and behave in order to have those things, okay? Um, I might want to sit around and eat Cheetos all day, right? But I also know that the reality is, is that it's going to make me extremely out of shape and it's going to give me a lot of headaches and I'm going to feel not good, right? I'm going to have a stomach ache all the time. I'm, I'm going to have very low energy, right? So it's like, how do I need to act in the world in order to have the life that I want? And what that means is I need to get off the couch, you know, once a day and work out a little bit, all right? Even though I don't necessarily want to every day, all right? These are sort of morality questions in order for like happiness and satisfaction as far as, you know, your romantic partners. It's like, you should probably, you know, be monogamous. Or if you're going to have an open relationship, like you need to have very honest communication with your partner, okay? So how does the, like... How does the world actually work? Metaphysics question, what is actually true about the world? And then how should I act based on what I know about the world? I don't wanna act based on just however I wanna act, right? I need to act based on how the world actually works. Uh, and here's the painting um, over here on the right. Uh, and this is sort of, again, in fresco, it's on the wall, you know, in the Vatican. Um, as mentioned, you know, this picture, you know, this painting is of multiple individuals. Um, so over here, uh, we have Socrates and Alexander the Great. Um, in the middle of the painting, we have Plato as well as Aristotle. Down here, we have, you know, Pythagoras, we have Euclid, um, we have Zoroaster, uh, Ptolemy, um, and then over here, hiding in the corner, right, is Raphael, which I think is a very Kanye thing to do, right? Just like, I'm important too, I'm going to put myself in the corner of this painting. All right, that's kind of a, you know, fun little fun little gesture for Raphael to do a little self-portrait of himself, 
you know, saying I'm important. All right. Um, so, uh, yeah, so with Zoroaster and Ptolemy, uh, we have cartography, right? So like mapping out the continents um, as well as astronomy. So mapping out the stars. All right. Uh, and again, these are sort of foundational figures. It doesn't mean that it begins and ends with these individuals. It just means that these individuals throughout the painting are sort of the first ones to sort of start the field. Right. Pythagoras and Euclid. Right. Euclid, you know, from triangles. Same with Pythagoras. You know, you know, the Pythagorean theorem. It's like these are individuals who are foundational to creating geometry in this instance. Uh, the two middle statues, if you go back to the original painting, go back a little bit. Uh, you can see this statue of Apollo, who is the god of truth, right? So we have this term veritas, which if you go around and look at a lot of college insignias, there'll be a lot of Latin words on there. One of those words on a lot of them is going to be veritas with a capital V, right? The search for truth, what is ultimately true, right? This is Apollo. And we have Minerva over here, which my face is covering it up, uh, but that's the goddess of wisdom, right? She gives you wisdom. Again, this is like a morality question. It's like, how do I act based on how the world actually works, not how I want the world to work, right? Again, the way that I want the world to work is like, I want to sit around and eat junk food all day and watch Netflix and, you know, and, but still be able to like make money and be in good shape. But it's like, that's not how the world works. All right. Um, you know, you got to, you know, you have to behave in a way that is wise to how the world actually works. All right, the academic canon, all right? And again, I sometimes interchangeably, um, some people refer to it as the Western canon. I think the academic canon is a little bit actually more accurate. Um, I don't do it just to, you know, sort of be inclusive for the sake of inclusion. I think it's more accurate because there are non-Western uh, books and um, academics and thinkers and scholars that are in the sort of foundational readings that you should be, you know, having access to and that you should consume uh, during your four years at university. All right. So a canon, right? The canon is uh, the body of work that has shaped Western culture. All right. Um, so especially when we're talking about like Western civilization. Right. So here's the big thing I tell students. Right. Even if you don't like the books. Right. Even if you don't agree with it, it still influences culture. All right. So. The academic canon is not about your personal taste. It's not whether or not like you like to read this book or you, you, you like Shakespeare, you don't. It has nothing to do with that, right? Um, going through a you know, university program isn't about like, here's my, you know, the 50 best books that I want to read. And they're all these like kind of, you know, New York Times bestseller, like, you know, crime fiction novels. You know, it's like, that's not what the academic canon is about. It's about these books you should read. If you like them or you don't, that's irrelevant, right? You should read them because they are foundational in creating the culture that you are currently uh, living in, right? The culture that surrounds you. These books, this, this music, uh, this artwork has stood the test of time. It's been around for centuries for a reason because it has created the world around you. So there's a lot of people who come in and say, yeah, well, this stuff is old, right? It was, you know, this, this book was written 200 years ago. Why do I have to still read it? Well, the thing is, is that history did not start the day you were born right? You were born into a world that was shaped by books that have influence, that have had influence for hundreds, if not thousands of years, right? And you should be reading and consuming uh, those books, uh, that, that type, you know, the, the, that, that music, uh, as well as that artwork in order to understand the human experience, the history of the human experience. And again, down below, I have a, I have a lecture on what a liberal arts education is. You should watch that if you want to know more. Um, about sort of what a liberal arts degree is, but essentially it's I'm an expert in understanding the human experience and sort of what pieces of art uh, and literature have stood up to the test of time because they most accurately depict culture as well as the human experience. All right, so um, even if you're not a Christian, you should still read the Bible and understand its influence. Um, this is a book, uh, I recommend you read it. All right, it's not a canonical book per se. Um, but it's a book by this uh, individual you might have heard of. His name is Richard Dawkins. He's a very well-known scholar, um, and he's probably well-known for his, uh, debate, his, his debates on God. Um, I don't think he necessarily wants to be known for that, um, but he is, right? He gets into a lot of debates with uh, people who uh, are religious, okay? But he wrote this book called The God Delusion. He's written many books. Um, there's a 
section in the God delusion that is several pages long, you know, five to 10 pages long that I think is absolutely extremely important for everyone to read if you are, for instance, not a Christian, all right? Because Richard Dawkins, an atheist, uh, you might even say a very militant atheist, argues that everyone should read the Christian Bible. And he argues this from a perspective of academic, canonical, foundational text for understanding uh, Western civilization. So he goes through, again, it's you know five or 10 pages long. He just goes through all of these things that we know and understand in our culture, and he traces them back to where they came from as far as their biblical underpinnings. So certain words, certain language, um, uh, certain, um, uh, uh, certain literature, certain artwork, right? certain themes that you might see in like movies and pop culture. And he's like, yeah, he's like, all these things are connected back to these sort of various Bible stories. Uh, and this is what you should read the Bible so you can better understand the culture you're in, right? And again, this is an individual who is a very outspoken uh, atheist. Um, again, he titles a book, you know, the title of his book is called The God Delusion. So, you know, not only he's like, God doesn't exist. And if you believe in him, you're probably delusional, right? But he says like, you should read the Bible because it is a foundational underpinning for understanding so many other things. Uh, there's another academic whose name is escaping me at the moment who talks about the importance of... Um, English, people who are getting degrees in uh, English literature uh, to read the Bible because so much of the work of Shakespeare, um, Shakespeare reads it in, at a more interesting, deeper level if you understand the biblical references uh, that are made in uh, Shakespearean plays, for instance. All right. So even if you're not a Christian, you should read the Bible, understand its influence. Uh, even if you don't like classical music, you should still have a basic understanding of someone like Mozart, right? Uh, we're approaching the Christmas season. You know, everywhere you go out in public, it's going to have a lot of Nutcracker mu music playing. That's all Tchaikovsky, all right? That's all Tchaikovsky from the late 1800s uh, when, he, when he writes the Nutcracker, right? So again, even if you don't like classical music, you should understand the basics of like Mozart, Beethoven, Tchaikovsky, and a few others. Uh, and then finally, even if you don't like Renaissance art, classical art, uh, you should still know people like Da Vinci and Michelangelo. You should know some of the basic pieces of art. Um, in the uh, convocation speech I give below, um, one of the things that I challenge freshman students to do is to make three lists of 50, 50 classical books, 50 pieces of classical music, and 50 pieces of classical art. Those three lists of 50 are things that you should be working through uh, in your four years at university if you're getting a liberal arts degree, right? And I think that's bare minimum. I actually think students who are getting a liberal arts degree should read about 200 books uh, before they graduate, which is about one book a week. I know that that is extremely optimistic and probably unrealistic. Um, so if nothing else, I think three lists of 50, 50 books, 50 pieces of music, uh, and 50 pieces of art that are all classical, that are all canonical. You should go move through these things and you have a better understanding of so much more of these are the foundational things that so much, uh, so many more elements of our culture are built upon, right? We walk around culture and we just think that culture sort of invented itself. It's just here right now. But if you actually understand the foundation from which it's built upon, uh, culture becomes far more interesting. All right, when you understand, I've used this example a thousand times, when you understand that, you know, the Black Panther, right, the superhero movie, like you watch the Black Panther and you understand that that's Hamlet, you're like, oh my, like there's so much of a deeper understanding in this connection to the last 500 years of storytelling, specifically around these sort of like monarchical struggles for the throne. Um, Black Panther just becomes far more interesting after you've read Hamlet, all right? So this is why you need to understand the academic canon. So what is a liberal arts education? Again, longer discussion below in my uh, YouTube video on you know what a liberal arts degree is. I love this painting over here. Uh, it's called Monkey in a Studio. It's actually located in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Um, I'm close to the Philadelphia Museum of Art and actually a member uh, of the Philly Museum of Art. You can become a member too. Uh, I think it's if, I think if you're a student, it's like 50 bucks a year. Um, but uh, it's a it's it's pretty small, you know. It, it's a little bit bigger than an eight by ten. Um, but what we have over here is a liberal arts education is is well rounded knowledge of philosophy, art, music, and science. So Monkey in the Studio is supposed to depict like a freshman student going into university, and it's like just play around with a bunch of stuff, right? So you see the monkey has a little trumpet. It's like I'm not musically inclined, but it's like just kind of take a music class, see if you like it. All right, take a painting class. I'm not artistically inclined, but it's like take a painting class, learn a few things. Um, take a philosophy class, open up a couple books, like, you know, try to do some fun 
things that are completely out of your comfort zone, but it's just like get a little bit of everything, right? Taste a little bit of everything. By the time you get to your sophomore, junior year, it's like you're going to pick a major, right? It's like I'm going to be an English major, and you're going to go just read all of the sort of canonical books in the English like language canon. Um, but before then, it's like you should dabble a little bit in everything just so you understand. I'm an English major, but I understand a little bit of classical music history, right? I'm an English major, but, you know, I took an art class and I can sort of tell you a little bit about Renaissance paintings, right? And kind of how they work and who did them and what the reason was. Like, that's what this sort of monkey in the studio um, painting is all about. And I love it. Uh, there's also what's known as the Great Books Program. This was a, mo a movement that started about 100 years ago, right? And what it tried to do was create a list of important books that it shaped the Western canon. And again, I use the Western canon, academic canon interchangeably uh, because this canon or this, this great books program has broadened a little bit. At the core of this, there's about 150 books, right? But it ranges based, uh, based on the context and the objective of, of the, of, of the, of the um, university, right? But again, it says like these important books, like if you read these books, like you get to be, get pulled into this academic cultural tradition um, where if you're a college educated person, it's like you should understand a little bit of Shakespeare. Like you should be able to have a basic conversation about, you know, Dante, right? There's, you know, there's just a few authors and artists and classical musicians. It's like you should just have, um, you should be able to have a small conversation about you, you don't have to be an expert on Tchaikovsky but you should at least be able to say like oh yeah I remember taking this class we learned a little bit about Swan Lake you know I know that he's Russian he did the Nutcracker like you just have a little bit of that knowledge at the front of your head somewhere all right again you deep dive into your expertise um, but the great books program is just it's about like here's all the books that everyone who has a college education just have some basic knowledge about because again we go back to that stuff with Richard Dawkins and the Bible it's like it's foundational, right? And again, even if you don't like it, even if you disagree with it, it's like just because you don't like it doesn't mean you get to erase, you know, thousands of years of human experience and culture building on top of itself to say, well, it doesn't really, I don't really like it anymore. Shakespeare's old and I don't want to read anything that old. It's like, yeah, well, he's, he's still creating, you know, the culture around you. He's still influential, all right? So this is what the Great Books program is. You can look it up more of it. You just Google the Great Books on um You'll be able to, you know, there's tons and tons of lists, but it's a core of about 150 books. Here's some of the authors they point to, right? So you do have people like Aristotle, Plato, Homer, St. Augustine. Talk about Dante, Dante's Inferno, Machiavelli, The Prince, right? We talked about that. Um, Voltaire, we've talked about Candide in some of my classes. Um, we come over here and we even have individuals over here um, who aren't fiction writers, right? So Faraday, Newton, uh, Darwin, uh, Freud. It's like these are individuals who are foundational, right? Lots of things with Freud have like kind of been overturned. A lot of people in psychology are like, oh, he did some things that are very weird. That doesn't take away from the fact that he was very influential and foundational. And if you're getting a psychology degree, it's like you should understand Freud. You should be able to talk intelligently about Freud and then say, I think he's kind of, you know, I, I don't I don't really, I don't really think he's uh, I don't really think he's uh, adding anything um, important to the conversation. But it's like, don't shy away from the fact that he's still foundational. He's still an important figure, all right? So um, you can kind of look at this list as a very short list. Uh, but again, all right, kind of covers, you know, people that you should just be aware of. All right, and finally, all right, I mentioned this before. We are going to critique the academic canon, and there's plenty to be to, to critique. Uh, just a little FYI, this painting here uh, is the Library of Alexandria Burning which it burned a couple of different times throughout his existence. Uh, sometimes it's because new tyrants would move in and they would say, get rid of all the books, right? Because they, do, they want history to start the day they were born, right? It's like, if I get rid of all the books before me, then I can write myself as the savior founding, you know, person, right? Of, you know, knowledge in the world. So it's like, get rid of all those books about all the kings who came before me, right? Sometimes the Library of Alexandria burned on accident, right? It's just, you know, fires happen and these are very old, uh, you know, fragile scrolls, all right? So there's plenty of times when lots of books and knowledge uh, was unfortunately lost. Um, but we have to sort of, you know, kind of remember, it's like these are foundational. This is where stuff started, okay? So the critique of the academic canon, the obvious one, right, which no one is going to dispute, right, is that the Western canon, right, and again, interchangeable Western and academic, the Western canon consists mostly of Western, kind of read white into that, uh, men, right? That's absolutely true. Right? And I'll get to this debate question down here in a second. 
right? So people say, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to engage with the academic canon or the Western canon because it's all white men. I'm like, yeah, it is, okay? Um, so don't shy away from that critique, right? Instead, let's talk about how and why that is. And then again, how I, we make sure that it's more inclusive as opposed to just saying, I'm not going to read Shakespeare. It's like, maybe we just re read Shakespeare, right? And like, maybe there's other ways to sort of bring other people into the conversation too. Um, but don't just sort of throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? Um, Postmodernists, uh, they think that knowledge is based on experience. So, um, you know, they argue, you know, you need more representation of women, non-Western people in the canon, right? So some of the books I would say belong in the academic canon would be things like, you know, the Bhagavad Gita, which is from India, um, the art of war, right? Um, there are plenty of non-Western people, um, cultural literature from hundreds, if not thousands of years ago that should be brought into the academic canon because it is influential to large portions of the population around the world um, outside of, you know, European descent, okay? However, right, here's the debate, okay? And I think it's an important debate, okay? So I don't want to, I don't want to shy away from it just because it's a hard, uncomfortable debate. So when people say, look, look, the Western canon consists mostly of Western white men, and I say, yeah, that's true, right? But the question is, is does that mean that the work is wrong, right? Does that mean the work um, is incorrect in his understanding of the human experience? Or does it mean that history was just exclusionary? Right. Does it does it mean that history just, you know, told women and non white people, it's like you can't come to college and do chemistry. Right. Right. You don't want to throw out Newton. Right. Or Einstein and say, well, you know, I'm just going to throw out their work because they're white men. It's like well, their work was still correct. Right. Or helped lay a foundation for us to discover more things that were correct in physics and mathematics. Right. The fact of the matter is, is like they were born into these very exclusionary times where it's like the, you know, the color of their skin and the fact that they were men, like allowed them to go to college and to have access to, you know, uh, these places where they could publish work and be influential that, and those places didn't allow other people to go in there, right? So you don't want to, you don't want to fall into this trap of saying because a book, right? Or because a discovery was made by a white man, uh, I'm going to throw out the discovery, right? Instead, my suggestion is look at this perspective of history was exclusionary, right? History did a lot of terrible things to a lot of different people, right? But you don't, but that doesn't mean that we take all of the work of Shakespeare or Einstein and say, we got to throw it out. And we're going to start over. It's like, no, like today you were born, right? This is the culture that you live in. That culture was created by a certain set of, um, of books and discoveries and art and music and understand how your culture got to be the way it was, right? By reading those books and understanding that culture and understanding that art and music and then work to make your culture moving forward more inclusive, right? But don't say, look, history was terrible and so Einstein's wife, who was a genius, right? His first wife was extremely smart, right? Um, gets a get does not get enough credit for her um, uh, her help in you know sort of creating an environment where Einstein was academically challenged in his house and also um, supported because his wife was taking care of the kids. His his wife was also a physicist, right? She is not well known in the academic canon because she was a woman and there was a certain place for women back in Einstein's day that was not good. Right. But it doesn't mean you take all of Einstein's work and throw it out the window. All right. So you look at it and say, look, if, you, if history was exclusionary and there um, and there is little work produced by women and non-Western men, do we throw out all the findings? And I argue, no, you don't throw out the findings. What you do instead is say, look, history did some horrible things to people. This is what survived. Right. Shakespeare survived. The rest is survived. Right? This is what survived. And this is what we start with. And we make things more inclusive by bringing in more foundational text uh, from around the world, but we don't throw it all away. All right. Um, so with critical thinking, right, history didn't begin the day you were born, right? And what critical thinking is, which we talked about before, critical thinking is the ability to have a debate with yourself, right? And if you want to critique the academic canon, right, or the Western canon, whatever you want to call it, right? If you want to critique it, that's fine, right? but you first have to know what you're critiquing, right? Do not be 
um, intellectually ignorant. Don't act anti-intellectual and say, Shakespeare was a white man, so I'm, I'm not going to read him because he has nothing to offer me. Hold on a second. All right? A better approach is saying Shakespeare is foundational. Right? It is foundational to an English literature degree, or an, yeah, an English lit degree, but it's also foundational to lots of other books and literature written from around the world by lots of different people of lots of different genders and lots of different ethnicities. Right? Shakespeare is foundational to so many, uh, so much literature that's been produced in the world uh, outside the Western world, right? For, for the last 500 years. So what you can say instead is like, look, you might not like Shakespeare, fine. First, read Shakespeare. Read Shakespeare, read a lot of Shakespeare, and then say, this is why I like him or don't like him. Or what you might say is like, I read Shakespeare and I like some stuff, I don't like other stuff. Or what you say is like, I read Shakespeare and I understand how he influenced Black Panther, and that's kind of cool, right? But now, you know, I'm hoping to produce more texts in the future that are written um, where, where we understand the contributions of non-Western men um, in a similar way that we are currently recognizing the contributions of Western men in the academia, all right? But don't throw away all of Western civilization and the entire academic canon because history was a shitty place, right? Which it was. History was exclusionary, all right? But don't throw out all of the findings just because history was exclusionary, right? You go back to this question. It doesn't mean that the work was wrong or incorrect. What it means is that history just didn't let certain people into places of influence, which is terrible on them, right? But the work that was produced is still good work. Dostoevsky is still good work, all right? Cervantes is still high quality work. Mozart, Beethoven, it's like these are still high quality work that we should know because it's foundational. And now we work to make sure that we kind of, we keep opening that door to allow more and more people into the academic canon as opposed to just saying, here's that academic canon for the last 500 years. Let's just get rid of it and act like it doesn't have any place in our, you know, any, any place in our schools anymore. That's ridiculous. All right. So that's what the academic canon is. If you want to be a scholar, if you want to have a college degree and say, I'm a college educated person, you need to have a good understanding. You get to come into this club of academia. You need to have a good understanding of the academic culture. Part of that academic culture is shared values, beliefs, and foundations for knowledge. You get those through the academic canon. Below, uh, I do the convocation speech. So you can watch my convocation speech. It was about 10 minutes. And I also do a explanation on what a degree in the liberal arts is, um, Yeah, what, what it does and what it gets you and what you should be expert in if you finish a degree in the liberal arts. All right. That's what I have for the academic culture section. I will see you all later.